Hello and welcome to our Lent course. Today I'll be reading from At Home in Lent, an exploration of Lent through 46 objects by Gordon Giles. Today's object is the fireplace and this chapter is called Ashes to Ashes. A reading from Genesis chapter 18 verses 27 to 33. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. I, who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him, Suppose forty are found there. And he answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And he answered, I will not do it, if I find thirty there. And he said, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry, if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. And he answered, For the sake of ten I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Do you have a real fireplace in your home? Many houses do not these days. A few flats do. Or perhaps your fireplaces are blocked up. It is unlikely that you need one, even if you have one. Yet many homes still do have a functioning grate and chimney and an open fire in the living room has become a nostalgic, symbolic reference to an age from which we have thankfully moved on. A fire burning in the middle of a home is inefficient, dangerous and labour intensive. Many people have replaced the open fire with a gas or electric fire for reasons of safety and cost, although even these have their dangers. Nevertheless, we all know what an open fire is, and while we may not have one, or want one, they are still to be found in pubs, restaurants, and other public places, valued and maintained for the warmth they provide, and the focus of companionship they offer. The Latin word focus means hearth. Fire produces heat and light. The flickering flame stands with orange-hued shapes tinged with blue. In the glow, one can see and invent images and be mesmerised. You can even download videos of a flickering fireplace for the latest TV screens, which in some places are installed precisely where the fireplace used to be. Something primeval is aroused in us as we sit in front of a fire, whether it is electronically created or a fire pit on a summer's evening in the garden. Fire is neither good nor bad. Shere Khan in Kipling's The Jungle Book calls it the red flower, because animals are invariably frightened by it, while only humans have harnessed its power for both good and evil. Centuries ago, the pillaging of our village led to it being put to the torch. Forest fires leave nothing behind. Wartime bombs and terrorist explosions fling fire in our faces. Yet Lewis Pfizer, the man who invented napalm also did pioneering life-saving work on blood clotting agents. This paradox is the paradox of fire itself, because the red flower is a beautiful life-giving agent of rebirth, as well as a dangerous flame. The ancient Greeks told a story of the phoenix, the mythical bird that self-immolated only to rise from its own ashes, combining fear and hope in this enduring idea. High on the southern façade of St Paul's Cathedral is a statue of the phoenix rising from the ashes, a symbol of resurrection. Christopher Wren had it put there after it was recovered from the ashes of the cathedral, destroyed by the Great Fire of London in September 1666. Underneath it, the word resurgam, I rise, makes Wren's rebuilding of St Paul's a Christian symbol of resurrection. As well as drawing on ancient imagery, the statue makes the very building an emblem of hope and new birth for the city of London. 
so comprehensively destroyed by the cleansing power of fire. For it should also be remembered that the fire of 1666 purged London of the pestilence with which it had been plagued with in the preceding years. Fire burns, producing smoke and ash. It consumes everything, turning it into a great powder. For most of us, fire and ash are our body's destiny. With Abraham, we can remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. In some churches, these words are said on Ash Wednesday, as ashes are smeared on the forehead in the sign of the cross, followed by, turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. In preparation for the day, palm crosses from the previous year are burnt, reduced to great ash for this purpose, also reminding us of the liturgical cycle of life, death and resurrection. Whether the rubble of St Paul's, the, the ashes of a palm leaf, the ashes in the grate at home, or our own mortal remains after the cremation has done its work, the product is basically the same, carbon reduced to ash. Abraham knew this on two levels. First, he knew that since God intended to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their extensive and rampant sinfulness, he too might be reduced to ashes along with everything else. Second, he knew that we are all but dust and ashes, inasmuch as at the end of our lives we become those. Just as what we have been is a vital part of what we are, so what we will become is also part of what we are. So it is as dust and ashes that Abraham entreats God to spare the city if just ten people can be found. His own mortality and his plea for mercy are connected. This is a juxtaposition that we still find in the penitential spirituality of Ash Wednesday and the days that follow. The words used when people are marked with ash invite us to combine our remembrance about mortality Remember that you are but dust, and to dust you shall return, with the recognition of our sinful nature and the need for mercy. Turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. Fire is a leveller, reducing everything to the same thing, rich, poor, large, small, animal, mineral or vegetable. Fire returns them to a common substance that came into being in the first moments of creation. So as well as being wisely frightened by fire, we are truly humbled by it. Ashes also symbolise the humility of penitence and mourning. Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ashes. And Jeremiah tells the people to do likewise. Daniel and Jonah both don sackcloth and ashes as an outward sign of spiritual submission and humility. The modern signing with ash is a poor but powerful reminder of an ancient association. To be asked is to be daubed with death and smothered in sin. To return to the fireplace at home, the hearth of warmth is also the purifying place of penitence, lined with ash as it is. So just as our earthly homes are both warmed and endangered by fire, so too are we fearful of and grateful of the purifying fire of God's love and mercy. So let us pray. Creator God, as we stare into the flames and remember that we are but dust and ashes, help us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. Amen.